we have two big things in the word, and one of them is the commandment, and one of them is the commission that we would truly love. Love God, love people, love ourselves with the God kind of love. And the other one is the commission. And the thing that ties them together is faith because faith works by love. And um, Great Commission, go out and disciple all the world. Well, we're told that when people see that we have love for one another, they'll know that we've come from him. So love is key, but faith works by love. So this month is a month of, of faith. Um, and, and it's not about what you believe because that's a belief. Faith is actually a spirit. Second Corinthians chapter five, it calls faith a spirit. Thereby we have the same spirit of faith. We speak. So faith speaks, but faith is more than that. Faith works and faith is obedience because if it's just words and we just say, well, I believe, nothing happens. Let me use this. Let me just pray. And we're going to have communion, but I want somebody to just ask yourself, is God wanting me to bring communion? Right, just, just be open if God wants you to bring communion because we've done a month on it. And some of you would have got revelation about it and you don't want to just sit there. I want. We're an apostolic sending centre. Come in, I top you up, we send you out. You come back, you be refreshed, we send you out. Um, you know, Mike and Gwyn are over in Africa. Um, we've got Shelley with her Bible study. Um, we've got Liz Howland who does the Outback. Um, we've got Paul Lewis with India. We've got Murray Fru with the uh, Third World Nations. Yeah. We've got Ruth and Peter with Israel. Um, I think I've forgotten somebody. Val, Val with, um, thank you, Above Rubies, a family thing. So we've got at least nine that we send and fund on a regular basis. Um, but it's it's about finding your destiny and, and fulfilling it, using this as your base, going and doing it. It was about faith. It is all about faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? So let's start with that scripture in um, Hebrews 11.6. So, Father, we're just going to pray first. That's what I said. Oh, no coffee either. Um, Father, we just come before you and we thank you in the precious name of Jesus that we don't need anything but you. Yeah. You said when we feast on you, we'll never be hungry again. When we drink of you, we'll never be thirsty again. You are everything. You nourish us. You nurture us. You give us all the nutrients that we need, spirit, soul, and body. You are everything. And we feast on you, Jesus. Yeah. We feast on you. We dive deep into the word of God and we feast on you. We take communion and we feast on you. Jesus, you are amazing. And we thank you that you're our king, you're our Lord, and you're our God. And as we open the word, Jesus, let us not see it as it is but let us live it the way you wrote it. Let us live it the way you wrote it. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to guide our days and to shape our desires that in everything we do, we'd bring glory and honour to God in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 11.6. says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You cannot be satisfactory to God without faith. But whoever would come to God must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. So, you know, there are rewards for faith, but there are some conditions. You've got to seek him. You've got to believe that he exists. And, and believing and faith are two different things. I can believe in God. But my faith in God is expressed by what I do. It's action and, and it's, an, it's um, obedience. When he tells you to do something, faith is obedience to do what he's told you to do because it says in Romans 14, I think it's verse 23. Let me turn there. Romans 14, 20, 
it's either 21 or 23. I love this. This is just, I love this scripture. Apart from Romans 12, 3, where he's given me, 17, 20, he says, because of the littleness of your faith, they couldn't drive this demon out. And he said, because of the littleness of your faith, you didn't truly trust me. But truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. Nothing will be impossible. And when you speak to the mountain, that actually is a demonic controlling factor. When you speak to that mountain, it is a demonic government in your life. He's not saying to speak to the mountain, but speak to you know, speak to the mountain of debt, speak to the mountain of sickness, speak to the mountain of unemployment, speak to the mountain of whatever. He's not saying speak to that natural thing. What he's saying is you speak to the demonic authority behind that that is allowing it to stay in your in your life. Move, speak to the mountain, speak to the demonic spirit that is keeping that mountain there and command it to move. It has no right to be in your life. It's criminal. It's criminal. It has no right in the kingdom of God. And so he's saying all you need is faith like a mustard seed, and that is the smallest seed. And it grows into this, thank you, beautiful bush. I can do that. Shane supplies the words. He grows into this beautiful bush. <laughs> but um, so, you know, it's recognizing that, that what is faith? So let me tell you what faith is. You're not going to get delivery of anything unless you labor. You don't, a woman does not deliver a baby until she labors. And if you are believing God for something, you know how we sit back sometimes and we say, oh, well, God's got it. Or well, God's got going to take care of this. That is not faith. That is laziness. That's laziness in the realm of the spirit. That is laziness. Sure, we can say God's, God's, you know, sovereign, God's in control, but there is a role that faith has to play. There is a role that we have to play. I have to come into alignment with the truth of God's word. I have to come into alignment with the promises of God. If there's anything in my life that's sinful, it's got to be sorted out. And it's not that it's not by works, it's not religious, but it is that there is a holiness that is required. And in the season that we're moving into, holiness is essential. But faith is, is you know, all you need is faith as a grain of mustard seed. And you can say to the mountain, be thou removed, and it will move because all things are possible. So what is the mountain in your life? What is it that is standing in front of you? What is it that's saying to you, no, you can't have this? Is there any area of your life where you are not walking in the freedom and the fullness that God has given you? If there is, write it down. And you need to hear well, what is God saying to you about that mountain, apart from the fact that it shouldn't be there apart from the fact that it's stopping you from moving into the destiny God's got for you, what is God saying to you about that mountain? What is the scripture, the revelation, what scripture has he given you for that mountain so that when you get the revelation of it, you can start to move? Because when you just say mountain move, nothing happens, right? It's coming out of my head. I, my arm is healed out of my head. My arm was like this. You know, but but when you get a revelation of what he's given you, when you understand what a revelation, then things start to shift. So what is it in your life that you need to shift? And what is the scripture that he's given you? You don't need a whole chain of scriptures. You just need one. Because Jesus is the living word of God. Whatever scripture you use, Jesus is it. He's the living word, right? So it's really, so what is he saying to you? And it, all you need is the revelation. So sometimes you're going to have to sit with that scripture and meditate it, pray into it, study it out, draw the richness of it out. What does it say in the Hebrew or the Greek? What, what is it saying to you? What are the scripture, the verses around it? What's happening as you read that scripture? Like draw it out, like get all the goodness out of it. Because until we start moving in faith, nothing is going to shift. And if we say things to ourselves, well, well, that's just the way it is, that's an acceptance of something that is not God's best. What are you thinking, Leah? 
I just saying programming, there's a, a way that we've been programmed to believe and it's a structure and it's sort of like that anyway. And it, it goes around and it's cycled. And when it comes up to us being fully persuaded and convinced of the truth, it's like we, we have the ascent. We're mm. going through the, the steps, but there's an obstruction. There's like an obstruction at the bottom and it can bottom out. And that obstruction has to do with um, the stacks that we've had of experience. And it's yeah. almost like a draw. That's what I'm saying. It's almost like a draw, like a, 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 a outdoor action causes us to default into unbelief and into systematic thinking rather than free thinking. Free. This is this is part of who we are. This is how the new creation works. We actually, our spirit doesn't need to be persuaded because no. we already agree. Yeah. It's our soul that's coming into agreement and mm. we don't need to be angry with our soul. We, we need to just remind our soul that we it's it's okay it's safe to continue to believe because we're safe because we're in Christ yeah and so so that that flap that flap doesn't bring us into a place of unbelief in them. so what Lee is saying is for those of you who might have trouble hearing her is that we've been taught to think systematically mm -hmm. like the church has taught us to think this this and this that's not the Holy Spirit the church is not the Holy Spirit right? The church is not. You're the church. You're the church. You are the church members. You're the church. So, but we have been structured in our thinking. You know, like some of us have been taught, we only need to pray once and then you thank him. Others have been taught, well, you continue to pray until it manifests, you know, and we've all been taught different things and we're all on different pages. But the thing is, when you come back to Jesus Christ as the living word and the Holy Spirit is your teacher, then you will find that we come into unity. And we come into this place. So what needs to happen in a lot of us is that the structured way of thinking that we have received from church culture needs to be completely destroyed so that we think from the mind of Christ because we have been given the mind of Christ. Your spirit knows everything. Your spirit is one with God. It says that in Galatians, right? Your spirit is one with God and Christ is in you and you're in Christ. If your spirit is one with him, and you know everything in your spirit. It's the soul that blocks it or it's the soul that encourages it. And sometimes we say things and you think, and, you know, we, we think it's right, but it definitely isn't. And you say things like, well, you know, why did God allow this to happen? Well, just wait a second. God is sovereign, but he's not sovereign over your free will. He's given us free will. And so he's not going to stop me from doing anything if I choose to do it, even if I say, God, if this isn't your will, I ask you to stop me. But if I still have that decision in my heart, well, I'm going to do it anyway. He's not going to interfere and stop my free will. He's given us free will. He will not violate himself. So we need to be thinking you know, from the mind of Christ. And look, let me tell you something. It's not heavy. It's a joy. It's wonderful. It's light. It's free. It's the way it should be. There's a grace and a peace. And, oh, Jesus, you're wonderful. And is this what you're saying? Thank you. And my unrenewed soul will be constantly being refined and, and renewed as I spend time in the word of God. It's not a question of telling my soul, it's okay, you're safe, which, you know, you can do if you want to. My soul just gets changed as I spend time in the word. It just, you know, it, it just, it's, it's unrenewed. It just needs to be fixed. So I just, I'm a living sacrifice. Here I am renewing my mind. I'm being transformed. But the thing is, we, we have to stop accepting what we've been taught and start asking Jesus what the truth is and what does he want to say. And let me just show you this. Now, if I can turn off these lights, and I can, because everything's perfect. Now, the electricity is still in the room, right? The electricity is still running, but I've turned the switch off. Some of us have actually turned the switch of faith off because we've been disappointed, because of things that haven't happened, 
because we've been disillusioned, because it just seems too hard. And so we've turned the switch of faith off. It may be not in every area, but in a particular area, yeah. you know, where I just never seem to be able to get my health right or I just can't seem to get this happening or just in this one area, I just keep going round and round the mountain. So that, that actually means that we've turned the switch of faith off. Because we've allowed circumstances, situations, decisions, the way we've seen things, our perspective, whatever, to kind of shut us down a little. COVID has shut down a lot of people. Gary Morgan preached a beautiful word on that this morning where he was saying people are thinking little, people are doing less, people are more frightened now since COVID. And so he was breaking smallness of of uh, of mindset and smallness of action and smallness of life of people this morning. But all it takes to activate your faith is turn the switch on. So the thing is, you know, when Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God, that word is not logos, which is the written word. That word is rhema, the revelation word. Man is to live by every revelation mm -hmm. that he gets from God. So if you go through, if particularly an e-sword, you can pick up all the scriptures where it talks about the word. You can see whether he's talking about a revelation or he's talking about logos because mm -hmm. logos is the written word. Rhema is the revelation. And that's the thing that changes everything when you get a revelation. And like Shane said, you only need one. But we have a spirit of familiarity that the church has dropped over us. And I'm not speaking against the church. It's the church culture. It's a spirit of familiarity because off you're sick, oh, well, by his stripes you're healed. Or he sent his word and healed you. Uh, or if you've got a need, well, you know, God will liberally, God will fill every need that you've got according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the revelation that you need. What is it that you need? What is it that the Holy Spirit wants to show you? Because there are things in your life that need to, to that he wants to upgrade. He wants to upskill. He wants to release you, Muriel. You have so much on the inside of you. It's like you're like a treasure chest. You're like full of these amazing gifts and, and talents and revelations of things. And I'm telling you, it looks like maybe you've never had, like with the boys and everything and, and Gwyn, and I'm not saying anybody's fault. I'm just saying that the opportunity may be. But I'm telling you, there is so much on the inside of you that God is wanting to draw you out. And, he's, and he, there is a space and a place and a grace for you because you are a, a high flyer. You're a high flyer and you need to come back and soar with the eagles. So, um, you know, and there's, there's all of us, we're, we're living here when God wants us to be living here. You know, um, there's so much more. We carry the presence of God. But how much is it? It's actually affecting things. Like if you step into the school, if you're a parent, you step into the school, how much is the presence of God on you changing the atmosphere at the school? What are you doing to change things? Like what is it in your life? Where are you unhappy? Like we're allowed to talk about this. I know when I went to, I first went to church, I was told you're blessed. And it was like, you're blessed. And don't you dare say anything that reflects that you're not blessed. Watch your words. You're blessed. And so we go to church and say, how is it blessed? Inside I'm screaming, like, help, I'm drowning. The kids aren't working right. I haven't got enough money. Help. But, oh, no, I'm blessed. So you go to church and you put on your plastic charismatic face and you do your Pentecostal thing and, um, you know, and you, you behave according to church culture. Mm -hmm. right church culture depends on what church you were in every church culture is slightly different but you behaved according to church culture and the first church I went to after I left the catholic church where I'm told when, I, when the nun said to me when I said I'm leaving the catholic church now moving on she said you realize you're taking your children to hell <laughs> I was like oh am I <laughs> But I knew I had to leave, right? But the very first church I went into after that, which was a Pentecostal church because I knew that was where I had found God, the pastor's father had died. And my friend and I went up to him to say, oh, we're sorry about your loss, like just sorry. And he said, don't you dare say sorry to me. 
he's in heaven. Don't you dare say sorry. He's gone to heaven. I thought, oh, okay. So then after that, I felt really difficult to, to express anything when somebody had died. You know, like, well, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to upset them? You know, and as a young Christian, it, it forms part of you. And so we have all these different experiences in church culture that affect us and we don't truly reflect Jesus. We reflect a church culture. And we're in that stage now where God's saying, you know what, I just want you to be my, my sons and daughters. I just want you to relax with me. I just want you to be my sons and my daughters. I want you to walk with me. I want you to represent me. I want you to be ambassadors. I want you to be members of a royal household. I want you to be my priests, my kings, depending on the hat that I tell you to wear on the day. Um, but I just want you to walk with me. But we kind of have, have sometimes in the past lost that ability mm -hmm. because of church, what we've been taught or what we've experienced you know, like when I first went into ministry, I had men get up and walk out because I was a woman minister. They would have walked out faster if they knew I was divorced. <laughs> but I got divorced before I was born again, but that didn't matter, right? That was, that was, and so, you know, like I, I felt like for a long time in ministry, I felt like, well, strike one, you're divorced. Strike two, you're a woman. Strike three, you're out. So I've been waiting for that strike three, you know, like where is it going to come from? Where's it going to get me? You know, but that's, this is the way that it works. And the number of men that would get up and walk out, the number of church I was not accepted in as a minister because I'm a woman was incredible. But it's not the way God is. You know, that's just church culture. But it, it affects us. And sometimes instead of reflecting Christ, I reflect a church culture that I, I don't even realise is there. And God is wanting to bring us into freedom, to shake all those shackles off, mm -hmm. to free us up so that we can think from the mind of Christ, so we can enjoy a walk of faith, so that actually faith is an adventure rather than, oh, my gosh, you know, by stripes, I'm healed, by stripes, I'm healed, by stripes, I'm healed, I'm not healed by stripes, I'm healed, by stripes. You know, we've got all this stuff going on, and, and it's, it should be an adventure. It should be a joy in the presence of the Lord. There is joy forevermore. And so, you know, we've got the, white, the word offering one thing, but our experiences in different church cultures saying, well, this is the way it is. And so we thought, oh, well, well, you know, like they should know. No, we don't. Like if I was, you know, could go back to the Bible college I was dean of, I would apologise to every student that went through. <laughs> but we thought, you know, part of it was good, but part of it was what had been passed on to, mm -hmm, sure. you know, and not necessarily Bible truth, but what we thought was truth. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, it's, it's coming back to just walking with Jesus and then faith just flows. It's not an, an act of I've got to dig up the faith. I've got to make sure I'm in faith. Oh, my gosh. No, I've been given the measure of faith. Yeah, and every time I take a step, faith flows because I'm walking with my Jesus. It's easy. Yeah. You know, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. So any time in your life where you're not feeling lightness or delight or ease, You've got to ask yourself, is that the yoke of Jesus? And it's the power of the anointing that destroys the yokes. Isaiah 10, 27. The power of the anointing destroys the yokes and lifts the burdens off your shoulders. And some translations it says that the burdens will be lifted in that day, the burdens will be lifted off your shoulders and the yokes will be destroyed because of your fatness. Well, I could take a particular, you know. <laughs> well, Lord, that'll work. <laughs> but, but it also means anointing. And it means that the anointing makes you so blessed, so prosperous, so successful that nothing can fit around your neck and put you in slavery. <laughs> nothing, nothing can put you into slavery again. Isaiah 10, 27, depending on your translation, depends on what you get. 
So, um, but, you know, but understand these things you, through the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, you can come into a freedom in life that is just joy. And no matter what you walk through, if Jesus is our redeemer, isn't he redeeming it? So if he's redeeming it, why are we stressed out? Why, why do we get worried if he's redeeming it? If I really believe he's the master redeemer and I'm going through a patch of stuff that's not very pleasant and I get caught up in the not pleasant and the unpleasantness, I get caught up in that and then I start to get worried or I get a little bit anxious or I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what if? Then that shows that I have no belief in Jesus as my redeemer. If you truly walk with him, then you, you, there has to be a belief that the fullness of who Jesus is is walking with you. Saviour, Lord, King, Master, Deliverer, Healer, Baptizer, Provider, Wisdom, Righteousness, Redemption, Sanctification. You know, everything that Jesus is is complete in you. And he's walking with you. You are complete in Christ. And so it just changes everything when we start to think, oh, my gosh, you know, it's not about church culture. It's not about church rules. Not one of you ever really listened to what the pastor says. <laughs> you all listen, but you're all, um, there's no yes people in the room, really, because you're all so so mature and so walking your own walk, which is wonderful, which is what I want, right? Because when Leah comes out with something, I thought, oh, I haven't thought about that. That enriches me. Shelley might come out with something, oh, yeah, I've never seen God that way. That enriches me. So the more we share, the richer we become and the freer we walk. Yes. You know, I've told you the story about my son yelling at God and telling him, what kind of a father are you? And I went, oh, you can't talk to God like that. And I sucked all the oxygen out of the room with my religious response. And my son says, well, I was thinking it. He knows I was thinking it. I might as well tell him. And I thought, well, there's a way of telling him and there's a way of telling him. <laughs> Standing there and screaming at him and shaking your fist, I'm expecting thunder and lightning to crash through the house. And um, when I went to my room later and I said to God, ah, you know, like forgive my son. And he said, there's nothing to forgive your son for. I said, what do you mean? The way he talked to you, the way he yelled at you. And he said, no, he was honest. I can handle his honesty. I can't handle your religion. Okay. Okay. And when one of my children ran away from home, you know, he was dealing with me the whole time. And I said to him, I was often saying to him, why aren't you dealing with the kid? The one that's causing all the problems. Why aren't you dealing with the kid? And he said, I'm dealing with you. And then I had to go to my parents and ask forgiveness for everything I'd done as a, a teenager that had caused them angst. My mum knew what I was doing. My father didn't have a clue. So he's making a joke about the whole thing. Oh, it'll take years to forgive you for everything you've done, you know. And so dad treated it as a big joke. And dad's saying, oh, you know, like, oh, oh, gosh, it'll take so long to forgive. All the things you've done, forgive you. And I'm thinking, I haven't been that bad, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I haven't been that bad. But mum understood where I was coming from. And so she said, I forgive you. But within a week of saying that, my daughter was home. Because he was dealing with me. I was the one that had caused the wounds in my child's heart. And so, you know, we, we have to come to this place of, of radical honesty. And when a seed dies, and quite often the seed that needs to die is pride, yeah. tradition, religion, when those seeds die, the radical, where we get the word radical, it comes from when you plant the seed that dies, it comes from the underneath the root that goes down first, that's the radical. So the root has to go down first. I'm right, aren't I? Yeah. You would know because you're married to Gwyn. Yeah. <laughs> and then the life comes up, you know, the plant comes up out of that. But the first thing that grows is the root down. So when something in us has to die, the root has to go down deep. So if I, if I am repenting of pride, 
and I, I'm burying that seed like a seed has to die in order to bring forth a harvest. The root that has to go down is humility, mm. meekness. Yeah. And then the, the fruit of that will come up. So whatever it is in the in in if we um getting rid of something that is on the negative side, it's always the opposite that we need to allow to take root in our lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so a lot of times when we think we've been in faith, we've been in mental ascent. Mm. And that's why we have not seen the radical aspect that we've been looking for. It just takes more meditation. <laughs> meditation. And engaging. And yeah. And because just as Jesus was the word made flesh, Mm -hmm. So the word has got to be enfleshed in you. Yeah. The word's got to be in you, just like it was Jesus made flesh, mm -hmm. the word made flesh in you. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says the word of God is like a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. In the Greek, it's double-mouthed, a double-mouthed sword. God has spoken it. Now you speak it. That's revelation. God's spoken it to you. Now you speak it. There's an, a, this month of October, and particularly with, with um, tabernacles, they lived under the booths, come out of the house to live under a booth, right, for a week. I'm not great at camping. I like glamping. Yes, hallelujah. Or, you know hotels or something not necessarily tents I'm really not into that but in the feast of tabernacles the Israelites would live in booths they made palm they used four types of um trees to make these booths that they lived in what I'm sensing is that God is wanting you to come out of the house of church culture yeah. and live under the tree of life. That's tabernacle under the tree of life. It's a freedom that he wants to release in you, through you, for you, to you, around you, and with you. But you're not going to find it in church culture. Right. But half the time we don't even recognize church culture that's in us. Danielle is really good at pulling me up. Hey, babe. It's good. Yeah. Wish I was as good with her. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but she's really good at just, you know, she's really good at saying, is that really what you want? Do you really believe that? Oh, no. No. <laughs> but he's wanting you to come out of church culture, church tradition, He's wanting you to come out of the way that it shaped you mm -hmm. because, you know what, if we have not been reformed to be Christ-like, mm -hmm. we are deformed because mm -hmm. it's just the form of us. right? Yeah. But then if I allow Christ to shape me, I'm reformed into his image. But if I allow church culture or tradition or religion to shape me, mm -hmm. I become deformed. Mm -hmm. So God is wanting to do a work of freedom this month or all the time. But in particularly starting with the Feast of Tabernacles, come out of church culture, come out of tradition, come out of the fact that you think you've got to be spend so much time in prayer or in word in order to be accepted by God. You don't. You've already been accepted. The blood of Jesus has paid the price. You've been made one with him. There's no separation. There's no division. The Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. He's given you the same anointing as Jesus. You carry the same glory as Jesus. In the Father's eyes, there is no difference between you and Jesus. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. So in the Father's eyes, everything Jesus has you have you're not short of anything you don't miss out on anything you. you have everything as Jesus had it and you have the same you have the same authority as Jesus yes. right you have the same authority as him you have the same anointing as Jesus it's the same Holy Spirit and so if you t carry this through 
This is where we get people like Wigglesworth, uh, John G. Lake. If you carry this through, they truly believed that they were in Christ, Christ was in them, that they were one, that they had the same anointing, they had the same authority, that whatever Jesus did, they could do greater works yet than this will they do, John 14, 12. But that's why we had people who could, um, the the what, what germs are, um, bubonic plague, would die in John G. Lake's hands when the scientists put the bubonic plague germs on his hands and he would put his hands under the microscope, the germs would die, the bubonic plague would die because the life of Christ was so strong in him, right? Um, John G. Lake spent a whole night when a, a, a African chief came out carrying his son and said, can you pray for my son? He's broken his neck. And John G. Lake was with another African man and they were just going around the villages. And John G. Lake said, there's nothing we can do. But the African man said, yes, God will heal him. So the African man took the child into the, the hut and spent the whole night praying and the child was completely healed. John G. Lake spent the whole night under a tree repenting of doubt and unbelief and asking that every ounce of doubt and unbelief would be stripped out of his being. You know, that's the kind of prayer that God honors. God, if there's any doubt, if there's any unbelief in me, strip it out. Just take it away. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want any doubt. I don't want any unbelief. If there's anything, take it. Yeah. So, you know, and so we look at these people, watch my knee. We look at these people and they go, oh, wow. But that should be the norm. That should be the norm. So if you carry this through, help me to phrase this right. If you carry this through, and you have the same authority as Jesus, and you've been given the power of attorney to use his name, and you have the same anointing as Jesus, then you can do the same ministry as Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can teach the same way Jesus taught with the same results. You can pray for the sick or command the, the disease to leave like Jesus did, the same results, because there is no difference in God's eyes between you and Jesus. You are loved as much. You carry the same anointing, the same glory. You have the same authority. You have the same name. There is no separation. Whatever you do in the name of Jesus, you can do it to the extent that Jesus did it. And just as Acts 10, 38, I think it is, says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. You can put your name in there. How God has anointed Muriel Jones of Mandaribar with the Holy Spirit and with power. And you can go about doing good, healing all that are oppressed by the devil because God is with you. And the only difference, the, the thing is, God is with you. God's with you in the building site. God is with you. He's not with the other jerks, jerks, people. He's not with them, but God is with you. Yeah, so understand this is that this is what you carry. And, and whatever it is in here that's stopping you from rising up and walking in the fullness of Christ, the fullness of the ascension power, the fullness of the throne of glory, whatever it is in here that is stopping you has got to be destroyed. It's got to be pulled down. It's got to be ripped out of your life because God is wanting to raise you up to be as Christ. That's why we're called Christians, as Christ, Christ-like. So, you know, allow the Holy Spirit to come in. You know, I've been saying to the Holy Spirit, whatever is in me that is not of God, like just destroy it. I just destroy it. I don't want it. I don't need it. It's a hindrance. I don't just get rid of it. I don't care how you destroy it. Just get, just destroy the thing. Just pull that structure down. Just change me so that I'm, I'm, I'm Christ is fully formed in me. I don't want Christ 50% in me. I don't want Christ 75%. I don't even want him 99%. I want Christ fully formed in me. I want to grow into the fullness and the stature of Christ, conform to his image. That's who God has called us to be. And so whatever it is in here, it's in our minds, it's in the way we think, it's in our heart attitudes, it's in our emotions, whatever it is that is stopping you from being the man or the woman of God that he's called you to be, of stepping out and stepping into what he's called you to do, you've got to get rid of it because your destiny, get this, this is profound, your destiny is wrapped up in the plans of God. 
And unless you are living his plans, his destiny will never be unfolded. Because God says, I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you, thoughts to give you a, a future and an outcome and thoughts of good and not for evil. But if you want to know what God's what God's plans for you are, it's wrapped up in his plan. So you have to unfold his plan. So, you know, start praying things like, God, whatever it takes, align my day with your plan. Align your plan with my day because it's hidden in his plan. And sometimes we don't take the time to get into God. What really is your plan for me? It looks like it's this because this is the door that opened up or this is where life has placed me or this is what this is. It looks like this is what it is. But God, is that really what your plan for me is? Or is that a subtle deception? Is it something I want and something not what you want? Because sometimes I would rather choose comfortable and familiar than to be courageous in an unfamiliar. Sometimes, you know, like I oh, just step back looks really good and God is saying step forward. Am I making sense? So, you know, we've, we've really got to, it's time to grow up, guys. We've got a nation. We've got other nations at stake. We've got a whole generation of children that are being What they're being taught in schools about genders and everything else is just the fear of climate change is affecting their minds. You know, we've got we've got youngsters that need to be know the truth. Yeah. Right? They need the truth. But we need the truth as well. Otherwise, we've got no truth to pass on. Yeah. So it take the time to say, God, this Jeremiah 29, 11 thing. I want you to unfold your plan to me. I don't want to be where I am because this is where I've ended up. I don't want this. I don't want me to think this is your plan because it just seems to have worked out that way. I really want to know that I'm in your plan because that's where I'm going to find my destiny. My destiny is wrapped up in your plans. So unfold your plan so I can have my destiny. And sometimes we allow our needs to shape our lives. We allow our, our finances to shape our life. We allow our relationships to shape our life instead of allowing Christ to be our life. And I know for me as a single parent, you know, on a sole parent's pension, there were a number of times that circumstances shaped my, my, my decisions, circumstances shaped what I chose. And in hindsight, I would never go that path again. In hindsight. But hindsight doesn't really do me any good. It's foresight that I need now. But what are you saying yes to simply because of your circumstances, your situations, your finances? Um, what are you saying yes to that maybe in the plan of God is not your destiny because your destiny is wrapped in his plan. And the only way you can please him is to live by faith, which is basically faith works. Faith works. So there has to be an action to your faith. Belief is kind of a static thing. Belief is I just believe. But faith has to have action. Because if there's no action, there's no delivery. Mm. But there is always some kind of an act. Mm. Like when I, we decided to get out of, by faith, we were going to get out of debt. We had a, a funeral service. We had a shoebox and wrote rest in peace. And in that I had a list of all my debts and bills and we buried it in the backyard and had a funeral service that from this point on poverty and lack would be dead to us. That was our faith in action. You know, if you want to, there's always something that you can do to say, God, I'm believing and this is the step of faith that I've taken. Yeah, believing is not faith. Yeah, believing is not revelation. faith. Just seek God for that revelation. Meditate the word. Um, whatever when you're fully persuaded yeah yeah I know you know 
but life by faith. Yeah. It's when you got that power of conviction, when my son had meningitis and he was in hospital and I just, I just knew if I got him to church, got the pastor to pray, he'd be fine. But trying to get him out of the hospital was a huge thing. And we had, he had to get, be carried into the church meeting on a mattress. He was too sick to walk or anything, but he was prayed for and he was instantly healed. My doctor didn't want to know anything because uh, it didn't fit with anything. But, you know, it's that when you just know that you know. But it's it's trusting the word of God above everything else. God is faithful to his word because he's placed, you know, he is his word. So this month is going to be on faith, faith that delivers, faith that um, destroys stale structures that need to be brought down so that we can truly live. So who is ready for getting rid of anything, any structure in our life that is not of Christ? Yes. Best to say yes without thinking. <laughs> yes. Best not to think, just answer it. So anything that's come from church, culture, family, traditions, um, you know, like sometimes family traditions are not always the healthiest. Um, they force us to do, not force us, but we're, we're trained in a certain way. You know, my grandmother was blind. We lived with my grandparents. Grandma was blind. Mum had an incurable disease, so what grandma couldn't do, mum did. What mum couldn't do, grandma did. And so I learned to milk the system. You know, I could just, grandma, yeah, honey, what can I get you? Oh, love my grandma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, you know, but but so it wasn't actually healthy for me the way, to be brought up that way. And everything had to be in such apple pie order because grandma was blind and she did the cooking. So if we put the pepper where the salt should be or did something like that, then, you know, okay, who did the wrong thing? Who put stuff? So when I grew up, I overcompensated the other way and became messy. Oh, I don't have to put everything back exactly where it belongs, you know. So there is stuff that you learn that you then react against, but neither one of it's healthy. But we're kingdom citizens and we've got a commission, co-mission, and we've got a commandment. And, you know, like we need to be fully trained, but we just need to be in Christ to do it, just in Christ. Church culture will not get you where the destiny of God wants to take you. Family tradition will not take you where the destiny of God wants to leave you. Mm. Vulnerability or, or low self-esteem will not allow you to get where God wants you to be. We've got to allow Christ to be fully formed in us. Holy Spirit, oh, love you, Holy Spirit. You are so powerful. You are so powerful. You can come as a fire. You can bring the word as a sledgehammer. You can you can just do whatever you want. But Holy Spirit, we come before you and we come as a group of people individually and corporately, and we just want to be set free of everything that has contained us, limited us, restricted us, held us down, put us in the wrong place, any place where we're not aligned with the plans and the purposes of God, any place where we're not walking into death, destiny, any belief systems that are not of God, anything in our life that is antichrist. We ask you to come and destroy it right now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. Come with a fierce wind. Come with a rushing fire. Come with whatever is needed to destroy whatever structures are in us that does not allow the freedom of the Holy Ghost to flow, that does not allow the fullness of Christ to live within us, anything that blocks the move of God, anything that stops the revelation, anything that hinders our faith, anything that is not of your kingdom, we ask your Holy Spirit, come and destroy it because we are your temple. So come Holy Spirit and take full possession of us. Take full possession. And every place where you have destroy where you are destroying and ripping down um, strongholds, mental ascent, church culture thinking, traditional thinking, religious thinking, anything at all, any place where you are pulling those things down and destroying them, we ask that you would release the living Christ within, that he would fill those places, that the glory and the peace of God would fill us. 
that you would remove all defilement, all stain, all imprints, and all effects of those things that have not been of you. Destroy them and remove them with the blood of the Lamb. Now come and fill us with peace. Come and fill us with glory. Come and fill us with truth. And let Christ be fully formed in us. Let Christ be fully formed in us. And Holy Spirit, as your temples, come and take full possession of us and govern us, that we would be governed by you, filled with you and governed by you, filled with you, governed by you. Filled with you, governed by you, that every place we go, we would truly represent Jesus Christ well. For Yah's glory. In the name of Yeshua. And I ask for everyone here that has a mountain in front of them, that you would give them the scripture and the revelation that they need to speak to that mountain and command it to move because we all have faith as small as a mustard seed and the faith has come from you, Father. So give us the revelation that we need for transformation in our lives. Thank you, Lord. We surrender everything to you. We surrender everything, every perspective, every viewpoint, anything that we might be hanging on to in the darkness of our souls, we surrender it all. Living sacrifices. Living sacrifices. And we just want to thank you. for the authority of Jesus Christ, for the anointing of Jesus Christ, that you love us as much as you love Jesus, that we are the same in your eyes as Jesus because we are your heirs and joint heirs with Jesus. So every single thing Jesus has, you have given it to us and we receive it all and we say thank you. Thank you. 